Let, let's go through some of the non-surgical sure. treatments first, because I think at the end of the day, everything converges on surgery when everything else has failed, is my sense of this. So even back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, pterodactyls were in the sky, and I was in medical school, um, we had hyaluronic acid, right? And you would inject those things. How do they work? Uh, are they safe? Are they efficacious? What's the deal here? And who uses it? Anybody? HA is safe, uh, although uh, with the old preparations, there was a 20% pseudoseptic reaction to the, to the molecules. The newer molecules are safer. There are less reactions to them. But let me be clear. Septic meaning infectious or septic? Pseudoseptic simply? meaning Pseudo? it looks like sepsis, but it isn't. It's, they it's have an inflammatory, so reaction. an inflammatory okay. reaction. an inflammatory reaction. Okay, an inflammatory reaction. To the so, injection, so. usually for injections that maybe weren't done in the proper place in the so I think that, you know, I, we, I think we all use them. I think there's a lot of controversy on the use of hyaluronic acids. Uh, I don't think we know the absolute mechanism of action, which makes a lot of people uncomfortable. You know, you know how penicillin works, and you know how ether works, right? And we don't know how this works. Uh, you know, Rich, you mentioned safety. You know, um, I can tell you, I didn't have a reaction till about nine months ago, and in the same week, I had two patients with the modern HA have this pseudoseptic. One had to come in and see my partner, and another one patient went to the ER. Yeah, it's a painful so, so, three days uh, when that happens. So there was a meta-analysis in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Don't, tell, don't ask me where I read that. But uh, it says that 4% of patients who get HA injection can have a complication. Now, 4% is high. Well, that's what I'm saying. But um, so it's not zero. You, there's always a risk-benefit ratio of everything. So uh, I think that, I think what's important is to understand what we're trying to achieve with hyaluronic acid in the osteoarthritic and the aging knee. The quality of hyaluronic acid, which is really the business end of synovial fluid, is diminished in quantity and quality. And so the concept is to give back a more normal environment to the joint by supplementing uh, the interior of the joint with hyaluronic acid. And I think there are differentiating features between the products, but the bottom line is that's the concept, and it was initially a mechanical concept to shock absorb and lubricate, which we thought was the major roles of hyaluronic acid. I think there's also information out there and good data to suggest that there perhaps may be some protective effects of the cartilage, um, decreased biomarker load in serum and urine relative to breakdown products of type two cartilage, there's even one study, preliminary study, that suggests an increase in proteoglycan content as a result of this. But at the end of the day, there is certainly some data as well to suggest a decrease in inflammation. And these products can be helpful in terms of reducing pain and improving function in patients. As Paul suggested, there is controversy about their use. However, I think in most of our hands, those patients who really don't want knee replacement or can't have it yet, are candidates for hyaluronic acid because there's very few other tools in our toolbox when patients get to that Yeah, point. I think that's key. So if a patient has end-stage cardiac disease, they're, on, they're smoking and you don't want to do surgery on that patient, there, there may be a role in, in uh, treating osteoarthritis I, patients. I only use care. hyaluronic acid when all else fails and they don't want surgery. So it's not a first-line drug? Absolutely no. not. So if, if a, but uh, to put, to, to, I'll just sort of push back a little bit because if you wait to the end game, the likelihood of efficacy is going to be less. There are certainly, uh, uh, there are certainly studies that suggest that earlier on in the disease, the efficacy is greater. So if you wait until you really need a Hail Mary, the well, hyaluronic the, but acid may a, not provide so I, that. I'll push back a little bit there. Earlier on in the disease, most people get better no matter what you do. So I, I mean, that, that could be a selection bias issue. The, the issue with... I think, and this is opinion, not fact, I think there are patient populations within the arthritic population that respond to HA. We just don't know who they are. Uh, you know, I want to echo what Rich says, and that goes into this, the use of steroids, is that I will make a decision. I, I agree with you, Rich. I think there's a wet arthritis, a wet osteoarthritis, and a dry osteoarthritis. In my hands, steroids work in those patients with a, an inflammatory or wet arthritis with an effusion. I personally don't use a lot of steroids in patients with this dry arthritis. And especially, I think there's, a, there's some good data in our uh, Journal of uh, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Just in October, uh, Elizabeth Matskin did a study uh, looking prospectively at 100 patients with steroids. 
and they found that the best result were in thin patients, a BMI less than 30, and those with stage one and two arthritis. That's steroids. That's steroids. I don't, I, just before we get off HA, yeah. just let me ask one last question. Again, I want to put a button on this. Okay. Is HA something a primary care physician can do? Ooh, that damped conversation. Ooh. So yes, I would yes. say absolutely. I, I think they can. Um, I, I personally, in my neighborhood of the U.S., I don't see the internist being comfortable with doing that. So I think it goes back to something you said before. If you identify a primary care physician who's interested in this or a nurse practitioner or PA that's designated, listen, aspiration and injection techniques are skills. And if you practice those skills and you're good at them, then you can do them. But I think that if it's just an occasional thing, hyaluronic acid needs to get where you want it to be. Steroids, you can kind of spray across the room, and if they get in the right <laughs> zip code, they're more helpful. But injections of hyaluronic acid, and truly steroids as well, really need to get into that intraarticular space. If you place hyaluronic acid in the synovial fold or in the fat pad, that patient's gonna be miserable. Yeah, yes, or if absolutely. you inject a steroid subcutaneously, people are not happy with that either. So Correct. you've gotta get into, into the joint. The question is, there are some of these HA mills in my neighborhood where they claim they're doing it under ultrasound. Uh, so we do a lot of our injections. Use, uh, our I rheumatologists don't. use ultrasound. It, it greatly increases the accuracy. Mm -hmm. Um, so, obviously, it's always easier to make an injection in a, in a joint that has an effusion. Sure. Um, you know, you take the fluid out, leave so, the needle in, do the injection, right? Let me see yeah. if I understand your saying, what you're saying. Gee, it's a, it's a crazy concept. If you want to do this, do it right. Practice yes. And Can learn how to do it. That? <laughs> if you do it wrong, that's bad. But if they are willing to put in the time and the effort to get the skill, okay. Uh, I uh, think they, they should be able to do it.